All right, if ever if everybody uh this is a song that we're bringing home from camp. So uh if you know it, belch it out. If not, I think you'll pick it up pretty quick. Thank you. 
be seated. Well, it's very good to see you today, and I hope you've had a great time of fellowship already and worship. We are very glad to have our youth praise band leading us in worship. Thank them officially for being here with us today. They'll be leading in all three services today, so pray for them as they continue to do that. And uh, it's a blessing for uh, those of us who, who are normally up here, who are very much a part of uh, the victor that's going on this weekend. It gives us just a time to kind of rest and uh, take a step back, enjoy the worship today, and uh, allow our voices maybe to be a little more refreshed tonight as we wrap up victor. Speaking of, if you haven't been able to come uh, this weekend yet, we would love for you to come and worship with us tonight as we uh, continue working toward Easter Sunday and uh, this week and what it means to us as believers. We'd love to have you come this evening. We're glad you're here today, though, especially if you're visiting with us. If you're a guest today, we want you to feel welcomed and loved and accepted and uh, want to do that in a couple of very real ways. One is we're going to greet each other here in just a moment. But uh, another way is there's a card there in the seat back in front of you, a Connect card. You can fill that out. Let us know just a little bit about you. Uh, you can put that in one of our tithe boxes, either here at the front of the worship center or there in the back. Uh, and again, just let us know that you're here with us today. You can click the, the uh, QR code or you can text to our phone number multiple ways you can connect with us uh, today. And we, again, would love to connect with you. On the back of that card is a, a place for prayer requests, and that, of course, is open to anyone who might want to share that with us. If uh, there's something burdening you or something going on with you or your family that we can lift you up in, we want to do that as a church staff. We're faithful in doing that each week in our staff meeting time and uh, would count it a privilege to be able to do that. Certainly, if God, if God is just doing something really amazing and wonderful in your life, you want to share that with us, we'd love to hear that as well. The main thing is we want to connect with you some way and make you feel welcome and uh, a part of what God is doing here at Trinity. Now, let's do stand and greet one another. Find somebody maybe you haven't seen today. Tell them how good it is to see them. My hands are all sweaty. That's all right. Will you continue in worship with us? There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's 
joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise, there's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise, oh, 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 oh. we shout out your praise, oh, oh. Join me as we read Philippians 2, verses 9 through 11. Therefore, God exalted him on the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Please pray with me. Oh Lord, we thank you so much for today. We thank you for waking us this morning uh, so we can all gather here together to worship you, to exalt you. We thank you for these students who are on stage right now, being bold in their faith uh, and leading us in worship. We pray for Pastor John. We pray that you will give him uh, the words to speak this morning as he leads us uh, in and through your word. Lord, we love you and we thank you for sending your son to die on the cross for us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. The creation suddenly articulate with a thousand tongues to lift one cry, and from north to south. Christ be magnified. 
this morning to come and to worship you with our hearts, with our voices and song. I pray that you prepare our hearts to receive the message that you have from your word for us. Lord, we're so grateful that uh, you walk with us and that you pursue us and that you want us to understand more of you today than we did yesterday. So Father, make yourself known. Help us to understand and help us to apply. We're grateful for all that you do. Christ, be magnified in us today and every day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We keep moving each week toward next Sunday, which will be Easter and Resurrection Sunday. And what a joy it will be to gather together on Resurrection Sunday and celebrate with the world that uh, Jesus is risen, that the tomb is empty. And uh, what a joy it is to be able to do that in a community of faith as a Trinity Baptist. We've been talking about who is this man. We've been leading up to who is Jesus. What has he done? How do we recognize him? What was his purpose? And as we think about we've been talking about Jesus. In fact, we talk about Jesus almost every Sunday that we get together. Uh, most of the time we talk about Jesus on Wednesday nights when we get together. Jesus makes his way into our conversation most of the times that we're together because he's the reason that we're here. 
He's the reason that we gather together because he is our Lord and our Savior. He is living in us. He is returning one day, and we are grateful for the opportunity of being on his team, being used by him to make a difference in our world. So who is he? Who is he? As we've lifted him up over the last several weeks, we've been looking at who he is, and we recognize from past sermons, past series, that he gives, that he has command over storms, that he has a command over storms, that he forgives sins, that he multiplies resources, and that he gives God glory. Who Jesus is is manifested in what he does, and what Jesus does affirms who he is. And so we recognize that Jesus is who he says he is because he does what he says he will do. Today we recognize a special day in in the life of Jesus as we think back in history that today would have been the day that Jesus came riding into Jerusalem. We call it Palm Sunday, a day that Jesus rode in on a donkey, not a stallion, not a horse, but a colt that had never been ridden before symbolizing his prophet status and not necessarily his king status. Next time Jesus comes, if you read Revelation, he's riding a white stallion. He's coming in as king. But this time on this Sunday years ago, he's coming in as a prophet. He's coming in as a servant. And as he comes in riding on this donkey, the people gather together and they take their coats, their outer coats, and they throw them down so that the path will be led for the donkey and be softer as he's walking. They'll take palm branches, they throw them down so that the donkey can walk across the palm branches. And the people are standing on either sides and they're declaring, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna. Any time that you hear the word Hosanna, I hope that you refer back to what that word means. That word means, Lord, save us. Hosanna. When you hear the word hallelujah, You ought to hear the word, praise the Lord. That's what that means, praise the Lord, hallelujah. When you hear the word, Hosanna, it's the Lord saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Lord, save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They go on to say, bless Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. They're calling out to Jesus, and Jesus receives this acclamation of the people as he's coming into Jerusalem on this day, Palm Sunday, years ago, even though they didn't understand it. They didn't know why Jesus was coming in. They had an idea. They thought the Messiah was coming in more or less to take care of the Romans and get them out of the way and take over leadership and have a kingdom again. But yet Jesus comes in riding on a donkey, a colt that's never been born, never been ridden before, And as he does so, the people are declaring him, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And we recognize that as Palm Sunday, this day back in history. But prior to this day, back in history of Palm Sunday, there's another day that Jesus comes near Jerusalem prior to Palm Sunday that we're going to talk about today. A day when Jesus goes to Bethany. And as we've been looking at the miracles of Jesus, we're going to continue to look at his miracles But before we look at the miracle of raising Lazarus from the dead, we want to set the the tone where Jesus raised two other people from the dead. So we think about the thoughts that are here. The the widow of Nain, there was a place just south of, uh, about 25 miles south of Capernaum. If you know much of the geography, Jesus' headquarters was Capernaum. That's where he spent most of his time that would have been his home synagogue. Uh, He grew up in Nazareth, so he would have known the Nazareth synagogue, but he had all of his ministry mainly around Capernaum where the fishermen were. And so there in Capernaum, what's taking place prior to the miracle we're going to look at first this morning is that there's a Roman centurion that comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, you don't have to come see my servant. You don't have to come to my house If you just say the word, I believe you can heal my servant. A centurion, a Roman, having this kind of faith and asking Jesus to heal his servant. Jesus is is really blown away with this kind of faith because he's not seen it even among his own people. And Jesus says, well, let it be done and tells him. And sure enough, they make sure that when all this is taking place, they go back and find out that the time that Jesus says it will be done, his servant was healed. What took place, Jesus said it, and it happened. After that, in Capernaum, Jesus goes to Nain, a little town about 25 miles south of Capernaum. And there, as he's coming into to Nain, he sees a widow 
who's walking out with a funeral buyer which is carrying her only son. Now, this is the last day in this widow's life where her community will give her assistance. She doesn't have anyone to look after her as a husband from this day forward because she's a widow. She doesn't have a a, a son to take care of her because he's now passed away too. But on this day, in the community, it was more or less the legal law that they would make sure that they took care of his burial for her and that's what they were doing. So there are a lot of people gathered together. They're going with this woman outside the city to bury her son. They're carrying this funeral bier. And when Jesus sees them coming out of the city gate, <clears throat> Jesus has compassion on her. He has compassion on her because he sees her present suffering. Here's the loss of her only son. He somehow knows that she's had past suffering also because she is a widow. But he also senses her future suffering because there's no one there to take care of her in the future. And Jesus, having compassion on her, he tells her, don't cry. Don't cry. She's lost her husband. She's lost her only son. I can think of a lot of things that Jesus could say to comfort her, but don't cry. Do you ever go up to someone that's lost and say, hey, don't grieve or don't cry? No, Jesus says, don't cry. It's almost an absurd statement to this woman who's lost her husband and her son. But Jesus says, don't cry, because Jesus is about to do something that he's never done before. And he walks over to the funeral bar, and he touches it. Now, you have to know, if you look at the Hebrew laws, <clears throat> that when Jesus touched the funeral bar, he became unclean, because it was illegal for them to touch the dead. So the four people carrying the funeral bar, they had already declared they're unclean, and they would have to go through a process of purification. Jesus goes over and touches the funeral bar, making himself unclean, just as if he had gone and touched a leper, which he also did, making himself unclean. But we might ask ourselves the question, is he really touching the dead if he's fixing to bring him back to life? He touches the funeral bar, and he says these words. He says, young man, get up. And he does. And he does. Possibly a day after what they call was his death, carrying him out of the city to be buried outside the city, the funeral bar is being processed out, processed out, and there Jesus touches the bar and says, young man, get up, and he does. And he gives him back to his mother, taking care of the future responsibility that she would have for a time. Now, the young man was not resurrected he suffered another death. We don't know when, but he did. He was brought back to life, but he suffered another death. There's another story that we read about Jairus. Jairus is the synagogue leader now back in Capernaum. And in Capernaum, where Jesus had his headquarters, this is the synagogue leader. This would have been the home synagogue of Jesus' headquarters for his ministry as he came back there often to Peter's house. And, and, and stayed with them. And, and, and Bethany, it would have been Lazarus and Mary and Martha's house and other places. He had a place he went. Here in Capernaum, it would have been Peter's house. The synagogue leader was there. He would have known him. That's where he went to worship on Sabbath. And the synagogue leader's been waiting now for Jesus to come back because he knows what Jesus has been doing. He's seen him heal other people. He's seen lame people walk. He's seen the lepers be cleansed. He's seen people that couldn't speak, speak, even in his own synagogue, right outside of his synagogue. And he's waiting for Jesus because his only daughter, his only daughter is sick and dying. And he's probably a little anxious in his own sense, saying, where's Jesus? Where is he? Why why didn't he come back? He'll be here soon. Where is he? He's asking all these questions. Jesus comes from the Sea of Galilee, across the Sea of Galilee, and when he lands in Capernaum, what does he find but the synagogue leader Jairus at his feet immediately, asking Jesus, Jesus, come and heal my only daughter who's sick and dying. Jesus has compassion on Jairus. He gets up. He begins to walk with this man going to his house and interruption. Something happens. The anxiety I can see still building in the man's uh, situation. Come on, Jesus, we got to go. And Jesus waits because as Jesus got up to leave, there was a woman who had an issue of blood for 12 years. It's a long time. 
In fact, she'd spent all of her money on doctors trying to cure her situation, and nothing was cured. But she told herself, if I can just touch Jesus' clothes, I can be healed. If I could just reach out and touch his clothes, I'll be healed. And so when Jesus is there, when he's walking away, what does she do? She reaches out and touches. <clears throat> and as she touches him, immediately she's cured. And Jesus says to his disciples, who touched me? And they're thinking, what do you mean, who touched you? Everybody is touching you. And he says, no. And he turns because he knew something, the power went out from him to heal this woman who said, if I can just touch his garment, she did, and it happened. He turns to her, and she has a conversation where he says, your faith has made you well. And she goes in peace. All of this interruption taking place, and now, as Jairus now has Jesus' attention again, they start to head to Jairus' house when messengers come from Jairus' house and say, don't bother him anymore. Your little girl's not sick anymore. Your little girl's dead. She's passed away. And Jesus hears what they told Jairus, and he tells Jairus this. He says, don't be afraid. Just believe, and your daughter will be healed. Don't be afraid. If you've just heard the words, your daughter is dead, you're not going to be afraid. You're not going to have some anxiety. There's not going to be some emotion building up within you because you've been anticipating this. This is the direction it's been going for days. Jesus wasn't there. Jesus now is here. He's coming. He's been interrupted, and now your daughter's dead. And Jesus says, don't be afraid. Just believe, and your daughter will be healed. Jesus takes Peter and James and John with him, and he goes to the house. And there at the house is all the weeping and the wailing. All the professional mourners are there. And we think they're professional mourners because in just a moment, they're going to complete their, they're not even going to think about their grief because they're going to laugh at what Jesus tells them. They're there to do a job, and the job is to grieve with the family and to cry for them. They've been hired to do this. And as they get to the house, there's all this weeping and this wailing, and Jesus gets us, and why are you weeping and wailing? This little girl's not dead, she's only asleep. To which the crowd that had been hired to be there starts laughing at Jesus. You know what Jesus does, right? He puts them out. I don't know how that happens. I don't think Jesus said, excuse me, would you mind leaving? <laughs> I get the idea that he picked one up and said, you're over here. And you're out the door. And you're out the door. And before long, the only people in the house are Peter, James, and John, and Jesus, and the parents, those who can believe and will see what God's going to do. And Jesus goes in, and he takes the little girl by the hand where she is. And was she really just asleep and not dead? Well, I think she was really dead. Jesus is trying to conceal who he is because the Spirit comes back to her, meaning the Spirit had left her. So she is dead in the room, and Jesus takes her by the hand and says, Talitha kum is the word that they use, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. And she does. Can you imagine the anxiousness of a father, a mother, a little girl being sick, close to death, dying, the father trying to get Jesus to come to his house, only to find out that Jesus is too late. To hear Jesus' words say, don't be afraid, just believe, and you'll see that your daughter will be healed. He walks through all this with Jesus, numb to the fact that his little girl is no longer there. They move the people out of the house, and, and then they go with Jesus into the room where the little girl is. And Jesus reaches out and takes her by the hand and says, little girl, get up. And she does. Wow. Jesus has brought back an only son to a widow in Nain. Jesus now brings back an only daughter to the synagogue leader in Capernaum. But then Jesus says this, don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody. Concealing who he is for now, because not everybody needed to know, but Peter, James, and John know, and these parents know that this little girl was gone and now she's back, but don't tell anybody. Can you imagine having that suppressed? Can you imagine not being able to have the freedom to say, look at what God has done for me. Look at what Jesus did. Our little girl who was dead is now back. Jesus told the young man, dead maybe for a day, to get up. And he did. Jesus tells a little girl, 
dead for maybe hours, we don't know. Little girl get up, and she does. He tells the widow of Nain, don't cry, Jesus is at work. He tells the, the, the parents, just believe, Jesus is at work. Who is this man? We now look at another story where Jesus brings life to death. And we find it in John chapter 11. John chapter 11, beginning in the 30, verse 38. If you've got your Bibles, you want to turn there, we're going to read about Lazarus. A story that really turns the tables completely against Jesus and at the same time opens the doors to see who he really is. Those who believe understand him in a deeper sense and those who are opposed to him have a deeper opposition because of what he's going to do in Bethany. John chapter 11, beginning in verse 38, Jesus once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with the stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, Jesus said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor. He has been there four days. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone and then Jesus looked up and he said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of my people standing here that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out. His hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. And Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Can you imagine that story being there at that point? at the tomb where the stone had been rolled over because it had been four days since Lazarus had died. Not just the day of or a day away, but four days now Lazarus has been dead and Jesus shows up and says, remove the stone and calls Lazarus to the entrance. Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? What takes place is about four or five days later, or earlier, what's taking place. Jesus has been on the other side of the Jordan. Bethany's on this side of the Jordan, and Jesus is on the other side of the Jordan because he's gone there because the last time he was in Jerusalem, they tried to stone him. They tried to kill him. They barely escaped, and they got away, and they went to the other side of the Jordan, and they've been there. While they're there, Lazarus becomes sick, even more sick, sick unto death even. And Martha and Mary send a letter through messengers to where Jesus is. It would have been a day's journey to find Jesus on the other side of the Jordan. And it could have been that they sent their messenger away and then Lazarus may have died pretty quickly after they sent the messenger. But a day over there, Jesus gets the message that Lazarus is sick. And as he's sick, he knows what's going to take place. And he stays there for two more days. He tells his disciples, our brother Lazarus is sick. He's asleep. And said, well, he'll, he'll wake up. He'll get better. He comes to really tell them, no, our brother Lazarus has died. And it takes him another day probably to travel and get back to Bethany. Thus, you've got four days that Lazarus is dead and in a tomb. And what we see taking place here is that as Jesus gets there, there's some things happening in Bethany that we want to look at this morning. We're going to kind of back into it a little bit. The first thing is that Jesus gets there, and what does he do? He brings Lazarus back from the dead. Jesus raises Lazarus to life. But before he did that, notice this. As they're back on the other side of the Jordan, they, Jesus says, we must go to where Bethany is. And they say, well, you know, the last time we were bothered, that's pretty close to Jerusalem. And do you remember the last time we were there, they tried to kill you? And they're trying to persuade Jesus not to go back because they don't know that Lazarus is dead. And it's Thomas who said, well, if he's going to go back, let us all go back with him that we may die with him. Doubting Thomas, he has a pretty good idea about what's going to take place, and he's willing the committed side of Thomas to walk with Jesus all the way back to Jerusalem if that's going to be the case. Whatever it takes, he's willing to be with Jesus. As they get back, they go to the grave, just like we told you about in the tomb. Jesus calls for them to remove, to take away the stone. And, and Martha says, oh, Lord, it's been four days. There's a really bad odor. Uh, the smell of death is unmistakable. And he says, just believe and you will see the glory of God. 
And then Jesus says these words as he prays to the Father. I'm praying these words not for you to hear me, but so they can hear me, so that they can believe that you sent me. And then he tells Lazarus to come forth. And Lazarus comes forth. And as he comes forth, he comes bound as they had put him in there. His feet are bound. His hands are bound. He's got, his head is bound. This, this walking linen cloth comes to the door. Hopping linen cloth comes to the door. And what has taken place, we don't want to miss that decomposition has now turned into recomposition. Those who were seekers are now going to be believers. Those who are opponents are going to be even greater opponents. Because Jesus removes all doubt for who he is, and the divine is in their presence. Remove his clothes. Remove the linen clothes that are there that's bound him and set him free. And they do. Poor Lazarus, I think. You know, there comes a time in life when when we think about what's going to happen as we get close to our time of parting here and going to heaven a lot of people will think about what kind of last arrangements they will make and put them in their will. And some people have a DNR, a do not resuscitate, something that goes if you are at a point where you're going to be hooked up to life support and you don't want that. You have a DNR so they don't put that on you so you can just pass on and we're going to be in heaven any who believe in Jesus. And so we have those DNRs. You know, I think Lazarus needed a DBB, don't bring back, you know, the idea that, that where he was and had to come back from where he was. He was dead for four days. Not the day of death or not the next day after death. Four day. He began to smell. The decomposition became recomposition. God put all the, the one who creates, recreated. And Lazarus comes to the door. And we see the glory of God. Who is this man? It's interesting that when Lazarus comes back to life, you know he signed his own death warrant. Because not only would he die again and being resuscitated, he would die again, but he now has a target on his back because the religious leaders want him dead. Just as much as they want Jesus dead. It's interesting that sometimes when God works in our life, the enemy will put a target on our back and we'll have to take some shots. But it's worth it if God gets the glory because of it. Wait and believe and see the glory of God. Who is this man? Prior to Lazarus being resurrected, something else happens that I want us to note today in John chapter 11. And sometimes we we take this as our, our one disciple moment, that we feel good about who we are because we've memorized Scripture. We've taken John 11.35 to heart, and we have memorized it, which says, Jesus wept. We feel good because we have memory in our, in our vocabulary and in our brain because we have two words and we use that. But why did Jesus weep? There's a lot of speculation. A lot of people think a lot of things. I don't know that this is exactly why, but I believe this is close to why. I don't know that Jesus was saddened because Lazarus had died. It doesn't make sense he would cry for Lazarus' death because he's fixed to bring him back to life. It doesn't make sense that he would feel compassion for all those who are grieving because Lazarus is dead because he's fixing to bring him back to life. So that's not the reason that he's crying. I believe the reason that he's crying is because he understands the price he's fixing to pay for life to come back to the dead. A foreshadowing of where he's fixing to go. And did Jesus handle it? Yes, he did. Did he, did he hinder any step? No, he went full force and did everything he was supposed to do. But it didn't make it easy. Even in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus cried, if there's another way to do it, let's go that route. But there wasn't. And he gave himself submissively to God's purpose. I think that's a part of the angst that's on Jesus, the biggest part of his emotion. But there's another thing I think is even greater than that, and that's the simple fact that Jesus had told his disciples over and over and over again, I'm going to die. I'm going to be placed in a tomb, and three days later, I'm going to come back to life. And they still don't get it. They don't believe. They don't know. Like I said, Jesus came in on this day centuries ago, riding in on a colt a donkey that had never been ridden before, being declared as king, Hosanna, blessed who comes in the name of the Lord. But the people didn't understand what Jesus came to do until after he came and did it. And Jesus weeps because those who knew him best still don't know. His tears here, I think, are for people who are his unbelieving friends, maybe 
even for the future of people who don't believe. And when we think of those who we know who have chosen not to believe in Jesus, this is where I think Jesus cries for them. Moved to the point of compassion that they have tears in his eyes. But he's about to remove all doubt. He is divine when he claims authority over death and physical life. And in the not too, not too near future, he's going to declare victory over death forever for all who believe. What takes place, we recognize that there may be sorrow in the night, but joy comes in the morning. Now, there's one other thing that happens that I want you to recognize out of John 11. And we kind of backed into this instead of walking through it. Lazarus was brought back to life. We recognize Jesus weeping, I think, for the unbelief of those around him. But prior to that, Jesus comes into Bethany, and we hear that Martha hears Jesus is coming, and she goes to wait for him. And Jesus and Martha have this embrace, and they have this conversation, a conversation that makes me almost think, I'm glad Lazarus died so that we get this conversation. Lazarus came back to life, yes, But this conversation gives us life as we understand what Jesus said to Martha. Martha sees Jesus and said, Lord, if if you'd just been here, my brother wouldn't have died. He'd still be alive. You'd have healed him because you love him. Because everybody you love, you're going to take care of. Things aren't going to happen to to bad people. Bad things don't happen to good people. My brother was good. He wouldn't have died. Jesus said, you know your brother will rise again. Martha said, oh, I know he will in the resurrection at the last day. Martha was one who believed in the resurrection as the Pharisees did, not as the Sadducees, but the Pharisees did, the most common group. They believed in the resurrection. Martha believed in that. But Jesus turns to her and he says these words, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. And he shares these words, the one who believes in me will live even though they die. And the one who lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? I want you to hear this this morning, that Jesus is speaking to two groups of people. That's inclusive of all people. Two groups of people, inclusive of all people. He's talking to those who have died and those who are alive. Who do we have today? we got people who are living and people who are dead. Jesus says this. Of those two groups, there's one common thing that brings life, and it's belief. For those who have died, if they believe, they will live. For those who are living, if they live by believing, they will never die. And so the common thread between those who have died and those who live is belief. And we come to believe today in what Jesus was saying. The one common giver, belief, believe. Well, who is this man? Who is Jesus? He's the one who tells the grieving in name not to cry. He's the one who tells the synagogue leader in Capernaum, just believe. He's the one in, in, in Bethany that comes and brings life to the dead because he is the resurrection and the life. Believe in him. I want you to hear this, this next little bit of, of our sermon this morning in a, in, as you hear an appeal. I, I, I give this to you in a sense of urgency. I want you to hear this today. This afternoon, we have a member meeting at 4 o'clock. It may not happen. It may not happen because Jesus may come before then. We have a, another opportunity of sharing the victor as a gift to our community, a presentation of the best story, the greatest story ever told. Tonight is 7. It may not happen. I want you to know, it may not happen because Jesus may come before then. And so I want to ask you this, are you ready for when Jesus comes? There's a sense of urgency for this question that we always have to have in our hearts and on our lips and in our minds because Jesus can come back at any point in time. This past Monday, I had an opportunity of sharing with a a group of men, and we got to give the, the plan of salvation to those men, and we don't turn the lights down low And we don't turn soft music on to try and let the mood kind of move us toward inviting someone to trust in Jesus. No, we have the lights full on. These men are some rough men. They're great men making some changes in life. And I ask them the question, does anybody want to become a believer and a follower of Jesus? Raise your hand. And men did. I ask you this question today. 
Is there anybody here that's dead? Are you in a tomb of sin? Do you recognize where you are and where you can be because Jesus wants to give you life? Here today, right now, if Jesus comes again, where will you spend eternity? I don't want to guilt you into anything or make you fearful. I want you to take advantage of the moment we have today. And if you're here and you're dead, would you raise your hand? Okay, I don't see any hands raised. I pray that we're all alive, that we have life in Jesus. But if we don't, there's only one life to have, and it's coming to Christ. And that's why we present the story. That's what makes the difference. Lives are still being changed every day. People are still coming to faith in Christ every day. I know of four men already this week that are going to be in heaven because they've made the choice to receive the Lord in their life this week. And I pray that we see many, many more in the days to come. Opportunities to recognize I need help. I'm dead. There's nothing I can do for me other than what Jesus has done for me. And when I believe by faith what he has done for me, I can receive the salvation he wants to give to us. And he wants to give to me. And he wants to give to you. The story's not over. The chapters are still being written. They're being written in our life. Lives are being transformed in the lives of disciples. We want to become more like Jesus every day. But we also want to make sure that there's an urgency upon what we're doing because we don't have any guarantee about tomorrow or even this afternoon. Be ready. Believe. Father, I thank you for the opportunity of sharing your truth this morning. And I pray, Lord, even with the sense of urgency that, that we know that we need help, and we can't get anywhere we need to go without your help. We know that you have made the way possible, that you are the way, Jesus, the truth and the life. And though there weren't any hands raised just a moment ago, Lord, I pray that if there's someone here that is dead and they didn't raise their hand, Lord, that you will impress upon them where they are in their relationship to you. And if they still don't have that relationship, Lord, help them today to come out, to come forth, to get out of the tomb and receive life in Jesus. Father, help us to present that story to all that we can and all those who need to hear. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand.
We want to uh, just let you know about a few things that are coming up in the life of Trinity. Um, First of all, just a reminder, next Sunday is Easter Sunday, and so um, services time as as usual, 8, 39, 45, and 11. Uh, We're looking forward to that. Don't forget the the children's event on Saturday. It'll be indoors, so rain or shine, we'll still be able to do it. Also, a couple of things, uh, I don't know if you've heard, but there's uh, an eclipse coming. If you haven't heard, um, there you go. We have, um, we have eclipse glasses out here in the, in the foyer, just out these doors over underneath the big sign. Um, and you're welcome to grab those. If you read on those, which I didn't the first time, if you read on those, you're not supposed to look for more than five minutes at a time. So pace yourself as you're watching, it'll be okay. Um, also, we have yard signs. If you'd like to grab a yard sign, they're, they're out there as well. Or during the week, whatever we have left, you can come, uh, come down to the office and grab those. And then finally, um, on the, the Sunday of Eclipse weekend, we, uh, we're, we're changing our schedule up just a little bit. We're going to try something different. Uh, we're going to have one combined worship service at 9 a.m. And then all of our Bible study classes will meet at 10. Okay, so if you're normally in this service, we're, we're just kind of pushing back up another time change, if you will. But 9, 9 a.m., everybody together. One of my favorite things that we get to do as a church. And then 10 o'clock, uh, we'll be, um, everybody will be in Bible study. Not, not all together. Your individual classes will meet. But we have enough classrooms to be able to, be able to pull that off. We're looking forward to that. Appreciate our youth praise team this morning leading us in worship and uh, what a joy it is to get to be a part of that today they'll get to lead again at 11 and in just a minute what we begin at 8 30 we close at 11 we close at 12 and uh, what a joy to be a part of a church that uh, receives all of that would you stand and receive this blessing the lord has for us today may the god of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with peace and joy by the power of the holy spirit Amen.